Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out on a nice evening like this. Luckily, uh, we had a Chinook come in, and it's not five below like it was a few days ago. Otherwise, all this little drizzle we're getting, we'd have a lot of snow. So thanks for bringing in the elements coming out. Um, tonight's presentation is part of our monthly series that we have here at the Interpretive Center every second Tuesday of every month. We're here, and we put on presentations, and the presentations are put on by the Portage Rap chapter of the Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation. Huzzah! Huzzah! Huzzah for the Portage Rap chapter! Bobby! <laughs> and we're, we're honored to have President Roosevelt with us, and I'll introduce him here in a minute. Uh, <laughs> so, don't be afraid to uh, just chime in any time on him, because he's used to it, he's used to Riding horses and buffaloes, and you know, he's, he's a westerner, although he's an easterner. Um, <laughs> we had a really good uh, turnout today, uh, here this morning, and President Roosevelt actually went to our schools this morning. He started off. At, yes, he did. <laughs> East Junior High School. The Rams. In the morning. The Rams. There you go. Eight hundred and some students. Right. Spoke to him. In the afternoon, he repeated this performance at North Middle School. The Grizzly! <laughs> and he had another 800 students approximately. It was only about 50, but who's counting? <laughs> so anyway, he touched the lives of a lot of our young students in our educational system here in Great Falls. And we're very grateful for that, Mr. President. I'm grateful as well. Yes. And hopefully a lot of them will take up an interest in, in, uh, in history and, and, and in his, his, uh, interest in politics and interest in government and serving your country. And I know you're going to talk a bit about that. Um, we also have some people here from out of town. We have Margaret, I don't know where she is, but she Margaret's from La Jolla, California. Oh. There she is, way up in the top. All the way from California. Uh, we have the uh, Cook County Commissioner here, uh, our president of the Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation, Lou Ritten, is here from Chicago, Illinois. Stand up for <laughs> And Margaret Gorsky, another member of the uh, board of directors of the foundation, is here from Sunny, Missouri. <laughs> so thanks for coming up. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Our speaker was born in New York City, New York, October 27th, 1858. <laughs> he graduated Phi Beta Kappa and Cum Laude from Harvard University, and he was elected the youngest member of the New York General Assembly. In the years to follow, he became a cattle rancher in the Dakota Territory, and he ran unsuccessfully for the New York mayorship. <laughs> unsuccessful. Anyway, he served as the United States Civil Service Commissioner. He was the President of the Police Commission of New York City. He was Assistant Secretary of the United States Navy. He was a Colonel of the 1st United States Volunteer Cavalry. He became the Governor of New York and then the Vice President of the United States and finally the President of the United States all by the age of 42. He doesn't look 42, but... It was a pretty good start! <laughs> he was the father of six children and the author of over 30 books. He was a big game hunter, a leading ornithologist, and he's the founder of the Boone and Crockett Club, the nation's first fair hunting and conservation organization. During his presidency, he declared some 200 and 30 million acres of national parks. <laughs> national parks, wildlife refuges, and national monuments. He was indeed the greatest conservation president we've ever had. Ladies and gentlemen, it's proud for me to present the 26th president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. Wonderful. President 
of the Portage Rock chapter. Not anymore. Lewis and Clark <laughs> Interpretive Heritage Foundation. And he says, not anymore. Did you lose an election? I did. Good. Thank you. And, and you're smiling from ear to ear. <laughs> you're all about it, aren't you? Well, to all of you who helped to keep history alive, I thank you for coming. I am Theodore Roosevelt, and I'm delighted to be back in Great Falls, Montana. I like what you've done with the place. <laughs> Congratulations on keeping history alive here at the Lewis and Clark Interpretive Center. And I'm most delighted as well to have met your most important crop, your young people. You're raising a good crop of young people here in Great Falls. And, uh, they've got the most wonderful examples in their grandparents and their parents and their family and their neighbors, many of whom are in service to the United States in the armed forces, in the United States Forest Service. So bully for Great Falls, Montana. <laughs> it did my heart good as an old politician uh, that uh, this morning at East and this afternoon at North, the young students recognized me. They'd, they'd been doing some studying about my life and my legacy. Uh, they greeted me accordingly. They said, good morning, Teddy, and hello, Mr. President. Uh, some knew that in my retirement, I preferred to be called by my old military title, Colonel, from my brief time in the United States Army, the first United States Volunteer Cavalry. History remembers us as the Rough Riders in the cause of Cuba Libre. Well, oh, bully. <laughs> I understand Cuba's not free anymore, but there's hope for the future. All of those greetings, historically accurate, stand in such stark contrast to my recent visit to Theodore Roosevelt High School in Los Angeles, California. And the students there are the Rough Riders, and my pictures and quotations adorn each and every hallway and classroom. But when I arrived there, I had my top hat. Uh, one young man spotted me, pointed at me, and told his friends, he said, look, there's the Monopoly dude. <laughs> <laughs> Quite humbling for an old politician, I assure you. But if he knew his history as well as you, he would have known I was the anti-Monopoly dude. <laughs> the great trust buster. Uh, well, you may well ask Theodore Roosevelt, why have you come back to life? 161 years after your birth, more than a century after my presidency, and some know, as of this last January 6th, more than a century after my own corporal demise. Uh, well, there is a pernicious rumor afoot. There is no truth in it. It is not true that I've come back to life because former Vice President Cheney needs a hunting lesson. <laughs> I've come back to life to celebrate the good and the great things about this country. There's nothing greater than what's being done here by the people of Great Falls. And I've come to perhaps repeat one or two things that I said a century ago that you might have encouragement in the duties you have as citizens of this great republic. It's a wonder that my life and legacy are so closely associated with the western states the open spaces of the national parks and the national forests and with the strenuous life that I lived and preached. For knowing your history, you may know that until recently I was able to say I was the only president born in New York City. Uh, now, President Trump, he's from Queens, but uh, I'm from Manhattan. <laughs> That's the real Big Apple. Uh, born and uh, bred on the Lower East Side of New York City, 28 East 20th Street, nearby Gramercy Park, New York City then was a city of a million souls and half a million horses, covered with sewerage of all sorts and a heavy black soot from the coal fires that we burned in the fireplaces. And far from living the vigorous life, I was a very weak and sickly boy. I had asthma. Now, any of you who has asthma or if you've had asthma amongst your family or friends, you know what a terrible disease that is, especially as a small child choking for breath and for life itself. Amongst my earliest memories as a boy, three, four years old, I remember hearing my parents speak outside my door as if I might not survive the night. It was my father, Theodore Roosevelt, the man for whom I'm named, and the greatest man I ever knew, who got me breath and got me life, often holding me aloft through the night. And on the nights when my asthma was at its worst, having the horses brought round to the front of the house and tied to the carriage, and with me bundled in blankets in the front seat of the carriage, my father speeding that carriage through the streets of New York in the hopes of rushing air to my young and sickly lungs. Physicians today tell me that rather than the speed of the conveyance, it was likely the excitement of the ride 
that naturally produced adrenaline in my bloodstream and assisted me to breathe. Uh, today, thankfully, the asthmatic child has the inhaler to restore breath, hopefully quickly. In my day, we had no such medicine. In my day, the treatment for asthma was worse than the disease. Can you imagine giving a small asthmatic boy a cigar to smoke? Oh, the idea was that coughing would stimulate my breathing. I was given bitter black coffee to drink, uh, again, uh, as a stimulant, and quite addictive. Uh, I became quite addicted to the bean as an adult. And I was given Ipecac syrup to drink. Oh, I, I hear by your groans and see by your grimaces. You're most of a generation who knows Ipecac syrup. Uh, the youngsters know it not. Ipecac syrup is something that you drink in order to see your lunch. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> Unpleasant memories for me to this very day. When I was a small boy of 11, still very weak and sickly, so much smaller than the other boys my age, my father called me into his study for a heart-to-heart -heart talk. I knew the seriousness of the subject to follow, for rather than calling me by the diminutive nickname by which I was known in the family, T.D., he said, Theodore, you have the mind, but you have not the body. Without the aid of the body, the mind cannot go as far as it otherwise should. It is hard work and drudgery, but you must make your body. I said, Father, I shall. And I set out to make my body with calisthenics. I lifted weights, I swam, I rode, I worked on the parallel bars and on the rings. I even took boxing lessons in the classical manner. <laughs> and I built my body. And it does appear I may have overdone it just a bit. <laughs> but when I was your president at five foot eight and 220 solid pounds, I was but a mere feather of a man compared to my successor. William Howard Taft, yeah. at times President Taft tipped the scales at over 350 pounds. And yes, it's true, he once got stuck in the White House bathtub. <laughs> when I was your president and Taft, our governor in the Philippines, we had word that Taft was in ill health with fever, perhaps near death. My Secretary of War, Elihu Root, cabled to the Philippines inquiring as to Taft's health, and thankfully, Taft cabled back. Health fine, rode horse 20 miles this morning. Root cabled back, how's the horse? <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as we've got him down, let's hit him again. In 1912, uh, I bolted the Republican Party uh, for the uh, nomination of the Progressive Party, the Bull Moose Party. It, it took its nickname from a statement I'd made to the press that I was stripped to the waist, healthy as a bull moose, and that my hat was in the ring. Uh, during that campaign, uh, President Taft was uh, not uh, as popular as he could have been with the grassroots of Lincoln's Republican Party, the shopkeeper, the mechanic, the farmer. Now, I first contested Taft for the Republican nomination. I won eight of the 12 primaries held that spring. I beat Taft in his home state of Ohio. Uh, but at the Republican convention that summer in Chicago, the bosses stole the nomination for Taft. Uh, by the way, not the first nor the last time that something politically was stolen in Chicago. <laughs> Taft carrying the nomination of the grand old party, his Brothers and other advisors told him that he must travel the country and make speeches. He reluctantly agreed to do so. Appeared before a friendly Republican banquet in New York City. He was hosted and uh, introduced by our fellow friend, uh, the Republican Senator and wit Chauncey Depew. Senator Depew had some fun at the President's expense before making his introduction. He patted President Taft on the President's enormous belly and he inquired of the President. He said, Mr. President, is it a boy or a girl? <laughs> President Taft was a rather quick-witted fellow. He said, if it's a boy, I will name him Virtue. If it's a girl, I will call her Integrity. If, however, it's simply hot air and gas, I will call it Chauncey Depew. <laughs> <laughs> Back to being a boy in New York City. Even in New York City, a boy could discover nature. I first did so in my father's library. Uh, pulling down the great picture books of John James Audubon's Birds of North America and Dr. Livingstone's Explorations of Africa, I would point to the pictures and beg the adults to read me the magical words below. It was you know, when I was old enough to explore outdoors, my, my parents indulged me, allowing me and my brother Elliot and our Roosevelt cousins who lived next door to spend a good portion of the day wandering through the parks of New York City, nearby Gramercy Park, Mr. Olmsted's Great Central Park with the American Museum of Natural History attendant there too. Uh, the charter for that museum was signed in the Roosevelt family living room. A Roosevelt family member on the board since its inception. And of course amongst its collection the great uh, hall of African mammals. 
uh, most collected by me and my boy Kermit after my presidency. Uh, the eastern edifice of that great museum, the official New York State Memorial to my lifetime, and deep in its recesses, uh, in its earliest days of its collections, some uh, bird's eggs and my skeletons donated by one young Theodore Roosevelt of 28 East 20th Street, just about when I was your size. Uh, we would wander along the wharves of the East River and the Hudson River that define Manhattan Island, and all along the way we collected snakes and bugs and turtles and birds, squirrels and rats and mice, alive or dead, it did not matter. We brought these creatures home and had on the fourth floor of our home something that we called Roosevelt's Museum of Natural History. <laughs> a very wide-ranging, though as any mother might suspect, a truly malodorous collection. <laughs> Well, you had to be careful coming to my house. If you poured yourself a glass of water from the pitcher, a snake might fall out of the pitcher into your glass, for that's where I was keeping my snake cool. If you reached into the icebox for a snack, you might pull out my collection of mice awaiting my experiments. Uh, one afternoon, I was walking up Broadway Avenue. I saw Mrs. Hamilton Fish, wife of the United States Secretary of State, walking down. I thought I should have some display of gentlemanly conduct. The report of my gentlemanly conduct might go home to my mother, much to my own benefit. Pride before the fall. As I passed Mrs. Fish in the street, I tipped my hat and wished her a good day. And when I did so, two frogs fell out from beneath my hat and fell upon her shoes. I'm afraid that the report that went home was not of my gentlemanly conduct. <laughs> Unlike the school children with whom we visited today, I did not attend a fine school or academy. I was homeschooled, and in the parlance of today, Christian homeschooled. The most important lesson of the day being the first. When I would wait at the foot of the stairs with my siblings, waiting to see my father come from his bedroom, attired for his day at the office. And when we saw him so, we raced for the family sofa, calling dibs on that portion of the family sofa that was between my father's body and the arm of the sofa. We called that prize spot the cubby hole. And there, each and every morning, our day began with Bible devotion. Uh, then my father off to work. Our lessons were taught to us by my Aunt Anna Bullock, uh, my mother's sister. She lived with us, exchanging room and board for teaching us children our lessons. Uh, not only my Aunt Anna, but also my grandmother Bullock lived with us there at 28 East 20th Street. Uh, all three women from Roswell, Georgia. I'm a New Yorker, but I stand before you half Georgian. As some historians say, if not for the stories I heard in my youth of men who hunted panther in the swamp, of others who marched off to Florida to fight in the Seminole Wars, of uh, two uncles uh, who were heroes of the Confederate Navy. My uncle Jimmy Bullock, uh, the head of the Confederate Secret Service in Europe during the Civil War, building half of the uh, Navy at Liverpool, including the CSS Alabama and the CSS Shenandoah. And my uncle Irvine, who fired the last cannon off of the Alabama in its fateful fight with the Kearsarge off the coast of France. I can prove my southern bona fides. Uh, when my grandfather, James Stevens Bullock, first proposed to my grandmother, Martha Stewart. Uh, this Martha Stewart refused the first proposal, as a lady was wont to do in those days, testing perhaps uh, the seriousness of, of her intended. Uh, my grandfather didn't have much in the way of uh, patience in issues matrimonial. He married young Hester Elliot. The following week, my grandmother married Hester Elliot's widowed father, John Elliot. Uh, John Elliott would go on to be elected to one six-year term in the United States Senate from the state of South Carolina. Uh, during those six years, my grandmother was said to be a wonderful hostess in Washington, D.C., a good mother to his children and their children together, returning to retirement after that six-year term, settling first in Charleston and then later in Savannah, uh, medicine and disease being what they were, uh, John, uh, Senator John Elliott died. Hester Elliott Bullock died. At which point, my grandfather successfully proposed to my grandmother. And when they married, he was marrying his stepmother-in-law. <laughs> if that doesn't make me a southerner, nothing does. <laughs> <laughs> Being homeschooled, I was good in some subjects. Uh, literature, history, natural science. Very poor or average in other subjects like uh, uh, mathematics, uh, Latin and Greek but it was natural science that was my greatest joy and pleasure, uh, such that when my father came to visit me my freshman year at Harvard and asked that question that perhaps many of you have asked of a student away at school or you yourself were recently asked, he said, Theodore, what do you plan to do with yourself professionally? I said, Father, I think I should like to be a natural scientist. 
He said, Theodore, that's fine, as long as you are not a dilettante, as long as you do serious work. The family had done well enough in business that my family eventually would not need to worry about its bread. If, however, Theodore, my father said, you have a taste for jam and butter, you had get, better get about the plan for the jam and the butter. Uh, my father taught me this issue of home economics. If I wasn't going to do remunerative work, that is, work for pay, if I wasn't going to add to the value of the numerator in life, I must reduce my expenses and thereby reduce the denominator in life and keep the fraction of life constant. <laughs> in my family, we called my father Great Art. Does anyone anymore read Bunyan? Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress? Uh, Best-selling book in the United States in the 19th century following the Bible itself. Uh, rarely read anymore. Uh, from it, uh, we do have some things that we remember. Vanity Fair, from which the magazine derives its name. The Slough of Despond, with a place with the men with the muckrakes in their hands. Men so busy raking up the muck and mire of human existence that they fail to look up and see that salvation is offered right before them. Hence the phrase I coined when I was your president, the muckraking press. I was not paying a compliment to the yellow journalists of my day. My father lived the gospel. He was a founding member of the Children's Orthopedic Hospital, the first hospital in New York City to provide free surgeries for the crippled children of the day. A funder of the Children's Home and Aid Society, an organization that saw the successful adoption of thousands of New York City orphans by Midwest and Western farm families. And on Sunday afternoons, by turn, my father would take one of us Roosevelt children by the hand and take us to the newspaper boys' lodging house, where the newsies, the orphan boys who spent morning, noon, and night on the filthy streets of New York selling newspapers for a penny or two apiece, because of the work of my father and other gentlemen at night, those boys had a warm and safe place to sleep, a, a good meal, and on Sundays, Bible study taught by my father. Still hard to put to words. What a terrible blow it was to me my sophomore year at Harvard when my father died quickly and suddenly of stomach cancer. He but a young man of 46. The entire city of New York was in mourning and I was in a terribly foul mood, writing in my diary to my siblings that I, I thought I might go insane from sadness. My tutor, Arthur Cutler, knew that in the past being outdoors and having strenuous exercise had not only restored my health but my spirits. That summer, he sent me to the north woods of Maine, to the great Aroostook country along the Penobscot River. And there with a hunting guide named William Sewell and his nephew Wilmot Dow, two men who short years later would join me ranching along the Little Missouri. In Maine, we hunted and hiked and canoed. We climbed Katahdin, uh, famous today, the highest point in Maine, as the northern terminus of the Great Appalachian Trail. We visited the lumber camps where my vocabulary was greatly expanded. <laughs> and each and every morning before we had our adventures, I took my own canoe to a place south of Island Falls, Maine, a place where the west branch of Lake Mattawamkeg River is joined by First Brook. And there in the early morning lights, by the sound of those waters joining gently, I began each and every day as my late father would have me do with Bible devotion. In the years hence, the people of the state of Maine have seen fit to name that little point of land a state historic site called Bible Point, so named for the fact that I, as a young man, sought and found the wisdom, comfort, and solace of the good book there. I would later in life say that a thorough knowledge of the Bible was worth more than a college education. But I returned to uh, Harvard to complete my education. I, it was my junior year. I threw myself into my studies, but as many a young man of that age as want to do, I fell in love with young Alice Hathaway Lee, the most beautiful girl in Boston, she was 17 years old at the time, uh, the cousin of a classmate of mine, they lived his neighbor some six miles distant from Cambridge on Chestnut Hill. And well worn was the dog cart path between Cambridge and Chestnut Hill my junior year, so much so that in the spring of my junior year, I proposed marriage to Alice, and she refused me. <laughs> in the fall of my senior year, I proposed marriage to Alice again, and she refused me again. But it's doggedness that does it. Persistence wins the prize. Well, today you might call it stalking. <laughs> in the spring of my senior year, Alice relented to my proposals, making me the happiest man in the world, agreeing to be my bride. I do understand that occasionally a married man has trouble remembering the date of his wedding anniversary. I took care of this. Alice and I were married on my birthday. <laughs> we honeymooned, but briefly, I knew that a man's first responsibility was to pull his own weight, to provide for his family. 
But I'd soured on natural science, at least the way it was taught at Harvard in those days, where a natural scientist was supposed to be men indoors, uh, looking through a microscope and doing dissections. Nothing like the great outdoor field work with which I had fallen in love. I enrolled in Columbia Law School and soon became doubly frustrated at law school. Uh, each and every day, marching between home and Columbia Law, twice each day, I passed the local Republican headquarters. Not surprisingly, above the local saloon. And much to the horror of my family, who did not consider politics to be the realm of a gentleman, I inquired about becoming involved, was embraced by the young men there. They ran me successfully for the New York General Assembly. I was elected its youngest member at the age of 23. As I left for Albany to take the oath of office, the erroneous words of one of my cousins were still ringing in my ears. He said, Theodore, don't you understand the Greek etymology of the word politics? Poly meaning many, and ticks being blood-sucking insects. <laughs> Off to Albany I went, and I was soon there known as the Cyclone Assemblyman. Oh, the cartoon has had a great deal of fun at my expense, drawing cartoons, my glasses, my mustache, my fancy New York City fashions. But I was the man with the sun in his face, happy indeed in great part because life offers no greater reward than working hard at work worth doing. Happier still for the fact that Alice and I were expecting our first child. Happy was the day when the telegram came to the floor in Albany announcing that Alice and I were the parents of a healthy baby girl. Congratulations were all about. Even my political opponents were happy for me. But then a second and most ominous telegram came. That telegram sent me for the train on the train down the Hudson Valley, racing to my family home in the middle of the night, where my brother Elliot answered the door with these words. He said, there is a curse upon this house. Mother is dying, and Alice is too. On the morning of February 14th, St. Valentine's Day, 1884, my dear sweet widowed mother, Martha Mitty Bullock Roosevelt, the Rose of Roswell, Georgia, she died of typhoid fever. And that afternoon, beneath the same roof and in my arms, my dear sweet bride Alice, she but 22, and a new mother, she died of Bright's disease, a kidney disease not quite treatable by modern medicine. There's nothing in my diary that day but a large black X and the words, the light has gone out of my life. I thought forever. A friend wrote of the twin funeral two days later. Theodore knows neither what he does nor says. But I was a man of faith. And my faith told me my loved ones were not gone, but gone before. And I took courage from the words of my late father, who said, Dark care seldom sits behind the rider whose pace is swift enough. Get action. Action I got. I had the baby named Alice for her late mother, cared for by my sister Anne, known as Bammy in the family. I returned to Albany, threw myself into the work of my legislative committee. Some nights spending the night sleepless, turning out seven or eight handwritten bills a night. The session over, I returned to New York City and saw to family affairs. Took the train west to Chicago, participated in my first Republican National Convention, leading the effort successfully to see the first man of color, Congressman John Lynch of Mississippi, a former slave, seated as a temporary chairman of a great national body convention. The convention over, I did not return east to New York City, but took the train so much further west uh, to where the newly constructed Northern Pacific Railroad crossed the Little Missouri River and the badlands of what was then Dakota Territory. Where the previous fall, in the after excitement of a successful bison hunt, I'd written a check for $14,000 to purchase 450 head of cattle and to hire men to be my cattle ranch foreman. I was now a cattle rancher. <laughs> if you think those rough and tumble politicians of Albany, New York, thought me a strange fellow, and they did. Imagine how the cowboys and ranchers of the Dakota and Montana territories <laughs> regarded me when I got off that Northern Pacific train. I was not of their kind. I actually carried and read books. <laughs> had and used a toothbrush. I had silver cowboy spurs, a silver cowboy belt buckle, and a silver hunting knife. Jeweled at Tiffany and Company. <laughs> My glasses were some sort of sign of a moral defect in a man's character. They called me storm windows and four eyes. But never to my face, only Mr. Roosevelt. I had one distinct advantage. I was the cattle rancher. I owned the cattle. The cowboys worked for me. And I earned their respect by working alongside them. No job too big, too small, too dirty for the boss, though early on translation was often necessary. Imagine when I gave the cowboys an order such as, hasten forward, quickly there. 
The cowboys just about fell out of their saddles here, Master Peter. When the men, when the men were in saddle, so was I. Sometimes riding the trail herd at the most monotonous of paces, uh, 16, 18 hours a day in saddle. Then to be greeted by sudden excitement as we stop stampedes or race the herd across rivers brimmed with running ice. When I came to the Badlands, it was still the Wild West, the West of Owen Wister's stories, Frederick Remington's and Charlie Russell's paintings and drawings, a, a West where I could ride for days and not even see another soul, the game and wildlife staring silently as I rode by. I slept at night with nothing but a billion stars for blanket and woke in the morning to the smell of sage in the air. It was not all romance. We knew toil, hardship, hunger, and thirst. We worked beneath the blazing summer sun and with the bitter bite of winter in our faces. We saw men die in violent deaths amongst the horses and the cattle or in evil feuds with one another. But ours was the glory of work and the joy of living as free men on the cattle range, the beat of hearty life in our veins. Oh, many were the adventures and misadventures I had along the little Missouri and uh, even in Montana. Uh, of course, uh, my cattle grazed on free Montana grass, uh, uh, the stockman's meetings in Miles City, why even my dust up with the Mingusville bully. Uh, have you heard? Modern day Weebo, Montana. Uh, I was off hunting after lost ponies. Uh, this is work I normally did on my own, hunting for game for the table for the hungry cowboys as I went and came. It was late at night, the weather was inclement, and uh, the only beds where a man could get a decent night's rest for 20 miles were above this saloon in Mingusville. I normally avoided going into saloons, and was reminded of one particular reason why entering the saloon in Mingusville. I heard gunshots coming from inside. I proceeded into the saloon and saw a room full of people smiling that nervous sort of smile that people smile when they're pretending to have fun, but they're really not. I saw the source of consternation for the patrons, mostly sheep herders, and the bartender was a half-drunken ruffian in a broad-brimmed hat, he with a pistol in each hand. He'd been taking target practice, a, a clock on the wall, the face of the clock riddled with bullet holes, and he had been using the most profane language to force the patrons to quench his apparently unquenchable thirst for whiskey. When I entered the saloon, he spotted his next intended victim. He said, Four Eyes is treating the next round. Oh, I laughed. He came, he stood above me, both guns cocked, whiskey heavy on his breath, and he said, I said, Four Eyes is treating the next round. Uh, well, I was unarmed. But thinking quickly, I noticed he'd made two mistakes. First, he was standing very close to me, and his heels were very close together. I rose looking past him as if I was headed to the bar to treat for those drinks, saying, If I must, I must. But as I passed him, I spun and struck him a mighty blow on the point of his chin with my right. Both guns discharged, not injuring anyone. I struck him another blow with my left, another blow with my right. That drunken cowboy fell over, hit his own head against the bar, knocked himself out cold. I, I was all of a sudden a very popular fellow in that tavern. And the locals began calling me Old Four Eyes. A bit more accepting and endearing by my neighbors. I mentioned Sewell and Dow. Uh, my first ranch, uh, that purchased, the operation purchased in 1883, uh, that was south of Medora, uh, down uh, upstream on the Little Missouri, but uh, along the Medora Deadwood Trail. Uh, and uh, that being the highway of the day, the customs were hospitality such that I was spending more time as a hotelier and a restaurateur for the weary and hungry traveler than I was getting any good writing and hunting and good ranch work done. So my neighbors, the Langs and Eatons, uh, others told me of some some bottomlands, uh, about uh, 30 miles north of Medora and downstream on the Little Missouri, without a neighbor for 10 or 12 miles in any direction, and with a mighty stand of cottonwood trees, sufficient in quality and quantity to build a nice ranch house and ancillary buildings, and, and it's this latter condition that probably uh, 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 will explain why I brought out two men from the north woods of Maine to run my cattle ranch. Neither man having any experience with cattle, and I don't think William Sewell had ever ridden a horse, uh, both men had ridden the logs down the Penobscot River during the lumber drive. Most importantly, they were my friends. Honest, hard-working, tough as bobcats. Uh, so I made them partners in my second ranch, uh, with none of the risk and half of the gain if there was to be any. Uh, we walked to the bottomlands of that northern ranch land, and that first morning many were the shed elk antler that we found. Of particular interest, two enormous elk antlers, their, uh, their skulls intact, demonstrating that the combatants had locked themselves in mortal combat, of course leading to the dehydration and death of each of the great beasts. Hence the name of my second ranch, the Elkhorn Ranch, 
Some call it the cradle of conservation for some of the early writings I did there with regards to the preservation of our wildlife and its habitat. I become quite concerned uh, traveling between the Badlands and New York City as I frequently did to see to family affairs and to avoid some of the bitterest of the Dakota winter. I saw that much of the ground between had been hunted out, the habitat spoiled, the rivers polluted, the forests clear cut. I realized that future generations would hold us in shame not for what we had used, but for what we had wasted. Before my ranching days were done, along with other gentlemen, we founded the nation's first fair hunting and conservation organization, Boone and Crockett, named for my heroes about which I hope you're still studying, Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett, and today headquartered in Missoula, Montana, still doing wonderful work for conservation. It was uh, along the Little Missouri that the romance of my life began. After my presidency, I told the people of Fargo I would have never been president but for my experiences in North Dakota. And I amend them tonight to uh, ensure you that those experiences were throughout Montana territory and the western states. Now, I'm perhaps known as the first cowboy president. Uh, famously, when I was nominated for the vice presidency, Senator, William, uh, uh, Senator Mark Hanna, uh, William McKinley's mentor from Ohio, he told his fellow Republicans, don't you realize what you've done? That madman cowboy is but one life from the presidency. <laughs> Sadly prophetic, those words. In the White House, I would tell Colonel Fall of New Mexico that if by some strange magical charm you were to take away from me every memory of my lifetime and vouchsafe me but one, the one that I would choose to retain would be of my time as a cattle rancher along the Little Missouri. And I know it's the people of Great Falls that understand that of which I speak. It was not only for what I learned about myself in those years, but for what I learned about my fellow American. Those men and those women that by the labor of the hands and the sweat of their brows have done the great building in this country. And besides, there's probably more than a dozen in this room that know that there's nothing so good for the inside of a man or a woman as the outside of a horse. And it was riding my horse Manitou across the buttes and through the coolies of the Badlands, hunting in the regions of Montana and Wyoming beyond it, even my great sadness healed, at least somewhat. Now, I would write my sisters back in New York City, bragging that I was as hard and as brown as a hickory nut. Uh, returning to New York City to see to family affairs, lifelong friends would walk right past me on the streets of Manhattan, not recognizing me for the physical transformation that had overcome me here in the West. In my letters to my sisters, I instructed my sisters that when I visited, under no circumstance, should my old childhood sweetheart, Edith Carroll, be anywhere about. I was a Victorian. I did not approve of second marriages, and I did not want to be tempted. And thank goodness, sisters don't always do what brothers ask them to do. <laughs> On one return visit to New York City, there in the parlor was my old friend Edith. We began to see each other socially, became secretly engaged. And nearly three years after my first wife's sad passing, Edith and I eloped and were married at St. George's Hanover Square, London, England. Returning to the United States, nine months and two weeks after the wedding, Ted Jr. was born. <laughs> the first of five children Mrs. Roosevelt and I would have together. We took the baby Alice back into our care, breaking my sister Bammy's heart when Alice was but a toddler. Fast forwarding through history as we must this beautiful evening in Great Falls, uh, I wonder if you realize in later years of the White House, Mrs. Roosevelt and I reared six children there. Mrs. Roosevelt claimed she reared seven children there. <laughs> that I was her worstest and largest child. Oh, I worked hard for the American people for what I called the square deal. And I said, when you work, work hard. When you play, play hard. When you work, don't play at all. But when the work day was over, I played hard. I did not have a kitchen cabinet of informal advisors like President Jackson. My informal advisors were known as members of the tennis cabinet. By invitation at the end of the work day, members of Congress, diplomats, Army and Navy officers would come to the White House, and we would play lawn tennis on the south lawn of the White House, right where Mrs. Taft installed the Rose Garden. In the White House, I boxed with Army and Navy officers, with former heavyweight champs like John L. Sullivan. I wrestled jujitsu and sumo with great bare chested men brought over by the Japanese ambassador. I played single stick. Uh, Mr. Boyle, have you ever played single stick, sir? No, sir, I have not. Oh, delightful game. Think of Friar Tuck, Robin Hood, Little John. Mm -hmm. uh, where men beat each other about the head with a giant wooden fence post. <laughs> Great bully fox. Entirely understandable. The man's played the sport and can't remember. <laughs> the game I enjoyed most, though, was an outdoor game, a hiking game, a game that we called Point to Point. 
A game we played with the Roosevelt children and their cousins in Oyster Bay, Long Island, where you can now visit my home, Sagamore Hill, a national historic site, ably administered by the National Park Service. And the way we played point to point in Oyster Bay was to first spin a small Roosevelt child around at point A. And wherever that dizzy child came to rest and pointed, beyond the horizon was some imaginary point B, towards which we raced in single file. The rule being that whenever you came to an obstacle, a, a downed tree, a creek, a, a fence, a cliff, a barn, a haystack, you never went around the obstacle, but always and only over it, under it, or through it. What makes for great dirty fun? We should play it here tonight at the Interpretive Center. <laughs> always more fun on a muddy night. Uh, I imported this game to Washington, D.C. and played the game with members of Congress and diplomats and with Army and Navy officers that showed themselves entirely too unfit physically to keep up with a fat, asthmatic president <laughs> racing through the woods. The most famous of my point to points was with the French ambassador, Jean-Jules Jusserand. Ambassador Jusserand came to the White House, obviously disregarding the part of the invitation that said, wear your dirty clothes. For he arrived wearing the finest French silks of the French court. Off we rode our horses to Rock Creek Park, dismounted, raced through the park for several hours, eventually coming to the Potomac River itself, which was in Freshet. And, this being a very fast, even wide portion of the river this day, the French ambassador, having swept through his clothes, he thought, certainly, this was our terminus, that we would return to the White House for some well-earned refreshments. But I turned to the gentleman at Creekside, and I said, Gentlemen, let us take off our clothes, put the bundles atop our heads, swim across the river, put our clothes back on dry, and continue a hike on the cliffs opposite. Can you imagine such a thing today? I think CNN would go live from a helicopter. <laughs> As we entered the water, I saw that the French ambassador, while he had disrobed, he'd kept on his lavender kid leather gloves. I said, Mr. Ambassador, why have you kept on your gloves? He said, Monsieur President, that's in case we meet any ladies. <laughs> I don't believe any president ever enjoyed himself in the White House as your president as much as I did. Certainly no family ever enjoyed themselves more than the Roosevelt family. Six children and most of them small. The head White House usher for decades, Mr. Ike Hoover, he wrote of the uh, Roosevelt years. He said it was no time for a person with a nervous constitution to be working at the White House. And the older boys pretending to be jack-in-the-boxes would jump out of giant vases just as startled visitors walked by. Or they'd come careening down the grand staircase riding on cookie trays stolen from the kitchen. My daughter Alice was 17 when we entered the White House, and her behavior was scandalous. Alice smoked cigarettes in public. She flirted with Army and Navy officers. When the White House punch was discovered spiked, we knew who the culprit was. <laughs> Alice kept a snake in her purse and introduced the snake as Emily Spinach at diplomatic dinners and receptions. Sometimes wearing that little green snake as a bracelet around her wrist or a necklace around her neck. Alice stayed out all night at dinners and dances and parties, returning to the White House at the break of dawn, scaring horses and pedestrians, for she was driving that newfangled invention, the automobile, at the breakneck speed of 30 miles an hour. Uh, during one afternoon conference with an old friend, Alice continuously and exuberantly interrupted. Finally, in exasperation, my friend said, Mr. President, can't you control your daughter Alice? I said, sir, I can either run the country or I can control Alice. I cannot possibly do both. <laughs> Well, I tried. I, I put my foot down and I said, Alice, no daughter of mine will smoke beneath my roof. Alice was often seen smoking on the White House roof. <laughs> Alice was famously and thankfully married at the White House in 1906 to Congressman Nicholas Longworth of Cincinnati, Ohio. He and the future a Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, the Longworth House office building, his namesake. Uh, the uh, wedding was a great success. Your, your grandparents may have played the song Alice's Blue Gown in the parlor. Uh, the color Alice Blue, popular for decades in women's fashion and home decor. Oh, the wedding a great success. The marriage uh, a challenge for all parties concerned. Uh, Congressman Longworth had trouble controlling Alice. She more trouble controlling him. Alice was a woman ahead of her time, very often sought out by members of the press for her statements with regards to policies, her endorsements of candidates, or just her quick wit, always ready with a quip, even in her saddest moments. Uh, Longworth died in 1931 while serving as Speaker of the House. He was buried in his native Cincinnati. The press asked my daughter, his widow, if she too someday would be buried in Cincinnati. And she replied, that would be a fate worse than death. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Longworth needed the votes anymore. <laughs> Alice outlived all of her younger siblings, living to the age of 96, well into the administration of President James Earl Carter and 
We remember President Carter in our prayers uh, tonight, he having surgery today, and our longest living president. Uh, Alice, I do believe her personality delightfully summed up by a needlepoint message on a pillow on her settee. The message on the pillow said, if you don't have anything nice to say about someone, come sit next to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all know someone like Alice. Contrasting sophisticated Alice on the other end of the family spectrum were the youngest boys, Archie and Quentin. Seven and four years old when we entered the White House. As the boys grew, so did their mischief. They and their friends, known as members of the White House Gang, so named by the members of the Washington, D.C. Police Force and the Secret Service, who were so often the targets of their shenanigans and their spitballs. One story illustrative. In the middle of winter, after heavy midwinter snow, I left the White House for an appointment. I ascended an open-air carriage. As I did so, one Washington, D.C. police officer gave me a crisp salute. And as the tips of his fingers hit the brim of his helmet, so did a giant 30-pound snowball drop from the White House roof. The snowball smashed through the officer's helmet and left him knocked out cold in the driveway. Now, I did not need to investigate. I turned over my shoulder. I said, boys, get down here immediately. Down the little monkeys came. They apologized profusely. They meant to frighten us for fun, not to harm anyone. Now, I looked into the issue, and I discovered... That officer was long overdue for a promotion. <laughs> there was a night when the Taft and Garfield boys came to the White House for a sleepover. Well, every parent and grandparent knows a sleepover is a good time to post extra guards. I drank a gallon and a half of coffee each and every day. I was normally the last guard awake at the White House. I read one or two books each and every day, often walking the hallways late at night reading, as I was this night of the sleepover. I was reading The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. <laughs> so much appropriate material given the boys sleeping over, and such that I was on guard for some sort of Tom or Huck-like mischief, and there was something afoot. I just could not put my finger upon it. And, but then I realized, as you know, the White House is a wonderful museum, a, a treasure trove of portraits of presidents and first ladies adorn the walls. And there is something truly hideous when spitballs have all been placed for their eyes. <laughs> I woke the culprits and they spent the wee hours of the morning cleaning off those portraits and in the words of diplomacy, the Taft and Garfield boys were persona non grata at the White House. They could not come and play for at least a week. <laughs> for I could not have done without their company any longer. Uh, you might know that the British ambassador wrote back to the uh, uh, Prime Minister that, that when dealing with the American president, one must remember that he's about six. <laughs> meaning years old. At four o'clock in the afternoon, whether I was in the company of a dusty diplomat or a member of Congress, I would excuse myself. It was children's hour. It was time to go outdoors and play, or in the winter months, up into the White House attic, to play amongst decades of White House treasures and amongst the White House rats. In the attic, we played bear. Oh, I am a most ferocious grizzly bear. Uh, the children running about half in terror, half in delight, in one afternoon session of bear, I was just about to pounce upon my prey when one of the boys turned off the lights. The next thing to be heard was a loud thud, and then my crying out, By Godfrey, turn on the lights! When the lights were turned on, the boys found me leaning up against a post, uh, holding my head with a hand over my eye, a trickle of blood coming out from below, sticking out from the post a four-inch nail. Oh. It had just missed my eye, and, and uh, when things calmed down, uh, Quentin, quite the quipster as well, he pointed out that it was fortunate that it had, for otherwise I would have been old three eyes. <laughs> Uh, the children enjoyed themselves in great part of the Roosevelt White House, uh, for the Roosevelt White House was a veritable zoo, a menagerie of acts like you, cats and dogs, perhaps horses, but I wonder if any of you at home has a pet badger? I do not recommend it. Our badger, Josiah, did terrible things to the people's furniture with its three and four inch claws. We had a one-legged rooster and a parrot that on command shouted, hurrah for Roosevelt. <laughs> The boys played with snakes and would lean over a balcony and drop a snake on the lap of a congressman waiting outside my office. I, I normally didn't protest. Given the characters in Congress, this was something akin to a family reunion in some cases. <laughs> oh, you realize that uh, there were so many uh, investigations of corruption in the United States Senate. Uh, I said when they called the roll in the Senate, the senators didn't know whether to respond present or not guilty. <laughs> the, the most famous of the children's pets was the calico pony Algonquin. Uh, we had stables next to the White House in those days. Uh, and one morning, Quentin, the youngest, brought the pony Algonquin, muddy hooves and all, into the front door of the White House, 
down the hallway, into the freight elevator, up the freight elevator to the second floor, down the hallway, and into his brother Archie's bedroom. They were rather easy to track and discover. Asked why he brought the pony into the White House, Quentin explained that his brother Archie wasn't feeling well, and he knew that he would feel better if he could just see his favorite pony. I can't explain the science or the medicine of the thing, but Archie did get better. Not easy to let go of such a life in the White House. Not easy for me to let go of the powers of the presidency. So much important work still needing to be done for the American people. But on election night 1904, on a night when I was being elected by the largest electoral vote and popular vote plurality in our history in a contested election to that date, I told my family and the press that under no circumstance would I be a candidate for the presidency in 1908, that I would observe the tradition of George Washington of serving no more than two terms in the executive, and that I would observe that tradition not only in its letter, but in its spirit. Now, I would consider the three and one half years that I was serving to complete the term of our march and President McKinley to be my first term. And this now being elected in my own right, no longer an accidental president, come to the presidency through the graveyard, I would consider this to be my second term. Mrs. Roosevelt winced when I said those words. And later that night in private, my most valuable counselor said, Theodore, that was not a very wise thing to say. Mrs. Roosevelt knew I just declared myself a lame duck for my entire second term. If I had troubles with Congress in my first term, which I did, they would be redoubled in my second term, and they were. A quick story for illustration. The year was 1903. Congress was on recess. In the words of Twain, the Republic was safe. <laughs> I went on holiday. And good citizens, when I was your president and I went on vacation, I did not go golfing. I went hunting and camping, and the latter in or nearby the national parks of this country. In that tour around the country in 1903, I visited 22 states and two territories. I, of course, returned to Medora, and there my friends and neighbors came in from the countryside on horseback and buckboard. We had a square dance. I made a little speech. I'm fairly certain I had seconds on pie. Uh, we came to Montana, and for two weeks down at Yellowstone, I camped with John Burroughs, the great bird man of New York's Catskills, no finer naturalist writer we produced. And there we observed the bison and the elk, the grizzly and the bighorn. And before leaving the park at Gardner, Montana, I laid the cornerstone at what is today known as Roosevelt Arch, above which are the words of the Organic Act, creating that the first national park in the world in 1872, for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. That's you. Our national parks are the most democratic of institutions. The national parks belong to each and every one of us. They belong to you and to you. And hence to each and all the responsibility to pass these parks on to future generations in better condition and not in worse. Now you might bristle at my moralizing, as did one senator at the White House. He said, Mr. President, you're preaching. I said, Senator, you're right. And the presidency is a bully pulpit, too. Now the bully pulpit is a very nice golf course nearby Medora, North Dakota. <laughs> and I've got to ask, give a turn around and Casey Moan give a wave. The former head professional at the bully pulpit golf course in Medora, North Dakota. Give another wave. Uh, there, there you are. Bully. Bully for Casey Moan. You know, Mr. Moan, I know that you're quite the golfer. I, not so much. I didn't uh, like the idea. My, my vision was so poor, I lost sight of the ball after hitting it into the woods. Uh, now my successor, William Howard Taft, he was a golfer and a famous golfer. Uh, but I instructed uh, Big Bill on taking the presidency. I said, Bill, don't be photographed in your golf costume. Uh, the, uh, the sport was thought to be too effete for the American taste. Uh, of course, on this and many other issues, President Taft did not uh, heed my advice. The photographic record is full of pictures of the, that great walrus of a man wearing a tam shanter and knickers and standing up to his ankles in a sand trap, uh, carrying a sand wedge. Not exactly an image that gives the people faith and confidence in the chief executive. I was a tennis man myself. Uh, my tennis cabinet. Uh, well, maybe we can play a game or two tomorrow out in the, out in the elements. Uh, in 1903, when I toured the country, I went on to... Yosemite. There I camped and tramped for three days and nights with John Muir, the great bearded botanist of the Sierra Nevadas, founder of the Sierra Club, and uh, namesake uh, uh, of my 18 national monuments. The first was fairly nearby, Devil's Tower in Wyoming. But amongst my national monuments, John Muir Woods, 
north of San Francisco, uh, the land and the trees given to the government by Congressman Kent. Uh, I went on in that trip. I saw for the first time the Grand Canyon of the Colorado River in the, what was then Arizona Territory. Have you seen the Grand Canyon? Bully, we saved it for you. I told the people of Arizona Territory, do nothing to it. That the ages had been at work upon it and that nothing that we did could improve it. But what we could do is preserve it for our children, for our children's children, for Americans not yet born in the womb of time is the one great sight which every American able to do so should see. Uh, when I returned to the nation's capital, I requested that Congress name the Grand Canyon a national park. And Congress refused each and every following year. I don't mean to offend your modern sensibilities, but in my day there were members of Congress working hand in pocket with special interests on Wall Street. <laughs> Perhaps I'm not offending your moral, uh, uh, your, your modern uh, sensitivities. Uh, can you imagine today what a crime it would be if the Grand Canyon were a giant copper mining operation? If at night the rim of that canyon was surrounded by the lights of hotels and casinos? Uh, in 1908, when Congress still refused to name the Grand Canyon a national park, I used the powers of the Monuments and Antiquities Act, much in the news of late, passed by Congress in 1906, under the able sponsorship of Congressman John Fletcher Lacey of Oskaloosa, Iowa, he who gave us the Lacey Act in 1900, which made it a federal crime to hunt game illegally in one state and transport that uh, poached game across state lines. The Monuments and Antiquities Act delegated from Congress to the executive, the executive authority by executive order to name certain public lands of historic, prehistoric, or scientific interest of NAS national monuments. When Congress in 1908 still refused to name the Grand Canyon a national park, I used the powers of that act. I signed an executive order naming the entire Grand Canyon a national monument. I said Congress would eventually come about its senses, which eventually they did, naming the park in January of 1919, about the only thing President Wilson got right. <laughs> in the immediate aftermath of my executive order, Congress turned handsprings in their wrath. My fellow Republican, Speaker of the House Joe Cannon of Danville, Illinois, he who had famously said, not one cent for scenery, he said of me, President Roosevelt has as much use for the Constitution as a Tomcat has for a marriage license. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to explain that to the children. <laughs> no, no, not yet. <laughs> well, I said that the Constitution's made for the people, not the people for the Constitution. There is no nobler sport than fighting for the right as you see the right to do, and as you see the right to do. Shame upon us as a people if we think we must agree on every particular policy, candidate, or office holder, and otherwise denigrate one another. We are one people, united by one flag, speaking one common language, the language of the Magna Carta and the Declaration of Independence, of the Gettysburg Address and Lincoln's Second Inaugural, Shame upon us if we divide one another. Uh, well, there I am preaching again. Uh, you didn't come to hear me preach, or perhaps you did. I think I got a good number of writings last time. <laughs> well, we've got elections for good reason. We're a nation not only of rights, but a nation of responsibilities. We gather tonight uh, on the day after Veterans Day. Armistice Day, as we called it in 1918, when the guns finally fell silent in Europe. You may know that my youngest, Quentin, gave his life for the cause of French freedom on July 14, 1918, as a member of the Army Air Service, flying over the Second Battle of the Marne. Uh, nearly four decades later, his oldest brother, Ted Jr., was the only general to go to shore on D-Day at Utah Beach, asked what he thought was the uh, greatest act of bravery that he'd witnessed in World War II, General Omar Bradley, did not hesitate, he said it was Ted Roosevelt at Utah Beach. In July of 1944, Ted Jr. died of a heart attack in the fields of France after having spent the night in conversation with his son, Major Quentin Roosevelt, namesake of his late brother from the First World War. Ted Jr. was buried at Normandy at, Col at uh, Colville-sur-Mer, uh, above the beaches of Omaha. And in 1955, his brother's remains were brought down from the northeast of France uh, from nearby Freems and brought down to be by his side, Quentin Roosevelt, the only World War I decedent, buried in our World War II cemeteries. Both boys, lying with thousands of others, 
testimony to the fact that uh, the United States has been willing and continues to be willing to sacrifice its greatest treasure that others might be free. So if there has been anything that you've taken from tonight in the way of entertainment or inspiration, I dedicate our evening, and I hope we each and every one of us dedicates a bit of our day tomorrow to the veterans and the active duty of this country. We live free uh, for the service and sacrifice that each and every one of them make. And now I must need uh, come near conclusion uh, and must admit that even those school children today, the, uh, the Rams and the Grizzlies, oh, they've learned a bit about me. Uh, they might learn that I thought my greatest accomplishment was the Panama Canal, a vision of mankind for four centuries uh, before my presidency from the explorations of Balboa, Opened in 1914, it cut to one-third the amount of time necessary to move our great naval assets from one ocean to the other. Not unrelated, the steaming around the world of the Great White Fleet. Sixteen battleships painted white the color of peace, and in circumnavigating the globe, accomplishing what no Spanish, Dutch, or English armada had ever accomplished before, and demonstrating to the powers of Asia and Europe that the United States Navy could do in peacetime what might be necessary to do in wartime. The Nobel Peace Prize awarded to me for settling the Russo-Japanese War with the Treaty of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, the Medal of Honor, awarded to me posthumously more than a century after the action in Cuba, in which every superior officer in the field recommended me for the commendation. But I have been writing letters and seeing them published in New York and Washington, D.C. newspapers, criticizing the War Department for a lack of planning and execution. More soldiers, sailors, and nurses were dying of disease and pestilence after the battles than died in the battles themselves. The Pew Food and Drug Act, Federal Meat Inspection, Railroad Rate Regulation, the Newlands Rec Reclamation Act, creating the Reclamation Service and damming 30 western rivers, irrigating millions of previously arid acres and providing for the settlement thereon by farmers and ranchers, the Intercoastal Waterways Commission, all of it, so much dust in the windy streets of history. I think I'm actually best remembered for the legacy not of success and achievement, but for the legacy of a failure, a failed bear hunt in Onward, Mississippi in 1902. Uh, we've been three days in the Cambridge of the Mississippi River, and we had not even seen a bear, in great part for the fact that my, uh, my hosts uh, from Mississippi and Louisiana attempted to outdo one another with regards to the expression of Southern hospitality. Uh, those of you that are sportsmen or sportswomen, you understand. You can either have a good hunt or a good picnic. You generally cannot have them both at the same time, in the same place. I'm sure, we scared every bear out of the woods by that third night. But on the third night, the famous hunting guide Holt Collier of Greenville, Mississippi, he came to camp in his youth, a slave. Uh, during the Civil War, body servant to his master. And after the war, the most prolific of the bear hunting guides in the Delta. Mr. Collier came to camp that third night and said, Mr. President, I shall have you a bear by morning if I need to bring it into camp on the end of a rope. We all laughed. The next morning, Mr. Carley and I were out early, but we found no trail, no spur whatsoever, returning to camp. Where later I heard men yelling and dogs barking, a man blowing a trumpet. I raced out from my tent, and there indeed Mr. Carley had tethered an old wounded male bear to a tree. The bear was greatly wounded on its chest. Hunting dogs had attacked the bear, and the bear killed two of the hunting dogs. Uh, Mr. Collier wanted to save his prize hunting dogs, but fearing to fire his rifle, for fear of harming the dogs, he went into the shallow water in which the bear and the dogs were wrestling, and he broke the barrel of his gun across the bear's head. The bear was bleeding from a great gash and wound on its head. When the bear was dazed by the blow, Mr. Collier tied one end of his lariat around the bear's neck, dove and tied the other end to a tree. And this horrific scene was the scene upon which I came, rushing from my tent. My horror compounded when one in my hunting party said, Mr. President, there's your bear. Go ahead and shoot your bear. <laughs> what a cowardly thing that would have been to do. I refused to shoot that bear. The story embarrassingly spread throughout the country. The cartoonist Clifford Barryman, hearing that story, drew a cartoon of the incident, called it Drawing the Line in Mississippi. The cartoon showed me uh, refusing to shoot a small bear cub tied to a tree. Uh, for Mr. Berryman, that little bear cub became the symbol of my presidential administration for years' worth of uh, political cartoons. When I returned to the White House, I received there a letter from the Mictum family, small candy makers, toy manufacturers in Brooklyn, New York, eventually the ideal toy company of New York City. Mrs. Mictum, in her letter to me, asking permission to make a stuffed bear and to name it after me. I wrote back, I said, you may go ahead and do so, but I don't think it will help your sales very much at all. I wonder if any of you have known the love and comfort of what then was called Teddy's Bear, with the apostrophe possessive S. Do any of you still have your teddy bear? 
Oh, up with your hands, men. Real men have teddy bears. <laughs> I see some of you ladies have married your teddy bears. That's, that's the way that works. The toy manufacturers, enthused by the unexpected profits that came from the sale of Teddy's Bear, they thought they might equally profit if they made a stuffed animal and named it in honor of each and every subsequent resident of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, the White House. But I'm afraid in honor of William Howard Taft and for the toy manufacturers, America's mothers never really took kindly to putting Billy the Possum into the children's life. Can you imagine such a horrid buck tooth theme? Uh, the Teddy Bear reigns supreme. I did promise Mr. Boyle here uh, uh, perhaps some of you have read of my post-presidential uh, uh, explorations in South America. You realize when I left the White House, I was but 50 years old. Uh, there was no presidential pension in my day. Uh, that came into the laws of the United States when Congress discovered that President and Mrs. Truman were spending their meager savings on letterhead, envelopes, and stamps to respond to the thousands of congratulatory letters they'd received in their retirement in Independence, Missouri. And so I had to uh, earn a living for my family, a growing number of grandchildren. I wrote uh, for Outlook magazine and served as an editor there. I wrote newspaper articles for Mr. William Allen White and his Emporia Gazette, syndicated throughout the country. I made speeches in exchange for remuneration. I've never made Clinton money, but I'm doing all right. <laughs> A uh, educational foundation in South America invited me to make some speeches uh, in the South. And, uh, uh, governments joined in. Uh, the Brazilian government augmented their invitation, asking if I would join Colonel Hondon of the Brazilian army. Uh, he, for whom the Brazilian province of Hondonia is named, a, a very forward-thinking man with regards to the treatment of the indigenous peoples of the Amazon. Uh, he and his men had discovered the headwaters of a mighty river uh, that appeared on none of the Brazilian maps when they stretched the first telegraphic wire across the Amazon. Hence his naming the river the Rio da Duvida, uh, Portuguese for the River of Doubt. And it was this river that I was invited to explore with Colonel Hondon. Mrs. Roosevelt joined me in the civilized portion of our tour through the capitals of the nations of South America and uh, uh, prevailed upon my son Kermit the boy who hunted with me in Africa, he was working in South America for banking and mining interests. Uh, Mrs. Roosevelt uh, told Kermit, please go along with father, keep an eye on father, and uh, Kermit agreed to do so, and uh, it proved uh, rather uh, important for the uh, activities ahead. Uh, even before we made it across the Mato Grosso uh, to the headwaters uh, in the Amazon, uh, well, half of the uh, Brazilian troopers had either deserted, uh, many of the professional scientists had done so, our oxen had died along the route, and we left much of our scientific equipment out uh, along the Mato Grosso. When we reached the headwaters, we had the uh, heavy labor of having to dig our canoes out of the giant trees that stood at the riverside. After soaking those canoes, we set off downriver and were nearly frustrated at every uh, opportunity. You can imagine here, especially where your chapter is named for the great portage uh, that was held here, that we had to portage seemingly every other mile or so, some falls or gorge that made it necessary to haul those heavy one and two ton boats out, to hack our way through the jungle, lay a corduroy road, and push and pull those canoes, and set that back in again, simply to find another waterfall another two miles or so downstream. It was calamitous. Uh, we were ill-provisioned. Uh, many of our provisions, uh, the canned goods, were lost into the river. As for fishing in the river, the river was full of piranha, more likely eat us than we they. <laughs> we found Brazilian nuts once. As for hunting in the jungle, as we thought to do, uh, much as we'd done on the savanna in Africa, uh, well, the jungle so dense and the game so scarce, a few monkeys and snakes that disappeared a few yards into the foliage, we were on quarter rations. One Brazilian trooper drowned. Another Brazilian trooper caught, second, uh, caught for the second time stealing rations shot and murdered one of his officers and ran off into the jungle, surely to his own demise, for we were surrounded by peoples of the Sinterlago tribes, some of whom still practiced cannibalism and hunted the human quarry with poison darts. I dashed my leg to the bone trying to save some canoes from being busted up, and I developed a malarial fever. For two days and night I lay uh, in the bottom of a canoe, while the entire safari lay still, much to its own peril, our only chance for salvation being downstream in supposed and hoped for civilization. I always took with me enough morphine to take my own life in case of a terrible gun accident or a bear mauling. I never wanted to be a fatal burden to my party, which I threatened to be on this trip down the River of Doubt. Those two days and nights in the bottom of that canoe, a 105 degree fever, 
And in my delirium, reciting over and over again a favorite line from Coleridge. In Xanadu did Kublai Khan a stately pleasure dome decree. In Xanadu did Kublai Khan a stately pleasure dome decree. In Xanadu. After two days of that, I would have shot me. <laughs> but my son Kermit said, Father, I'm going to take you out of this jungle, alive or dead, and it will be marginally easier to do so if you remain alive. With those words, Kermit saved my life. I recuperated. We completed mapping the river. I showed the results at the National Geographic Society headquarters in Washington, D.C. And the Brazilian government renamed the Rio da Duvida the Rio Roosevelt. One of its tributaries, the Rio Kermit. The family name was upon the map, and oh, it took quite a bit of uh, starch out of my sails. I lost 40 pounds. Oh, don't worry, I put the flesh back on the bone. <laughs> but some physicians tell me that my recurrent malarial fever is part of the weakening of my blood, its a tendency to clot, uh, my death of a pulmonary embolism. Spoiler alert, I died January 6, 1919. I come back through the wonderful magic of theater and through the sponsorship of the, uh, of the Portage chapter uh, of the uh, Lewis and Clark uh, Interpretive Heritage Society. What wonderful work they're doing here. Uh, one last story, if I may. October 14th, 1912, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I left the Hotel Gilpatrick to go and make a speech to thousands of citizens awaiting at the auditorium. I ascended an open-air automobile. I, I turned and waved to the enthusiastic crowd outside the hotel. When I did so, a madman reached into the automobile and shot me at close range with a 38 caliber. The bullet pierced my overcoat, my folded speech, my steel eyeglass case, lodged deep in my chest and knocked me down in the automobile in which I was riding. I first stood and, and made sure that no vigilante justice was done to the madman that shot me. But then, being a hunter and a former soldier, I knew to spit <coughs> into my hand and to check my spittle. There was no blood in my spittle. My lung was not punctured. It was but a mere flesh wound. I refused medical attention. I demanded to go and make my speech at the auditorium. The automobile took me thither. I climbed upon the stage. I pulled my jacket to the side. I showed the audience my bloody blouse. I said, you must bear with me. You may not understand. I've just been shot. But it takes more than a bullet to kill a bull moose. I spoke for 80 minutes with a bullet in my chest. And right now, some of you that were dragged here wondering what it will take to get me to stop hollering at you in the auditorium this evening. It is a school night, is it not? A, a delight and an honor to be with you tonight. A, a delight and an honor to see uh, old friends and meet new friends. I've got my little friend right here. This little fellow, he's a Badlands teddy bear. He's been bouncing around the country with me since last summer in Medora, North Dakota. Uh, well, he's looking to settle down a little bit. He's rather smitten with Great Falls. And he does miss his, uh, his old friends from Medora. So we're going to play a little game. Toss this back and toss this back and toss this back until it makes it up to Casey and Natalie Moan. And the next time I come, maybe there will be a little moan that will have that little teddy bear, all right? <laughs> Bully for the moans. Bully. <laughs> and that's the magic. The magic. Well, I we do miss you in Medora, and I thank you for the applause. We'll take a break and we'll start the second half of the program. <laughs> Just teasing. Come to Medora for the rest of the story. Uh, though I was the first president to make permanent office space available for members of the press at the White House, something I'm sure many of my successors deeply regret. <laughs> <laughs> but in that case, I would be remiss. Perhaps there is a, a question or a comment. Uh, uh, perhaps somebody would like a quick boxing exhibition. Uh, anyone at all? Volunteering John to box? <laughs> anyone at all? It, it is a wonderful night. Uh, do this old conservation president a favor. Take your children, take your grandchildren outdoors. Let them camp beneath the stars. Build a safe little fire, and beside that fire, tell them stories of your youth. There's an author, Richard Lowe, an author of a book called Last Child in the Woods. Therein, he and uh, teachers, journalists, social observers, they've observed a condition amongst our younger set, probably not these boys and this family, but 
uh, among some of your friends a condition called outdoor deficit disorder. <laughs> Not only that the children are indoors and on devices, but some children are afraid to go out onto the lake, down to the creek side, out into the woods. The places that for each and every one of us of an older generation, I'm sure, uh, they were in many ways our solace, our muse, our quiet place of reflection and prayer, a place of great promise and a great inheritance. Uh, the wild places should indeed remain wild, but let us take our children and grandchildren there and let them climb the trees and the cliffs and fall down and scrape themselves up a little bit. <laughs> for it's when they get back up and wipe away the pain and get back into the game that they demonstrate to themselves that they've got the right stuff in themselves. Godspeed, the good people of Great Falls, Montana. And thank you very much. <laughs> on their seats too long. <laughs> and by the way, my thanks to Mr. Scholl uh, from the Days Inn. I haven't had a nicer rest on the road than I've had at the Days Inn right here in Great Falls, Montana. Thank you for your kindness and hospitality. Just a brief note. Oh, this to work. Would you like to borrow mine? Speaking of my time. <laughs> the next uh, the December meeting will be January 10th. It'll be John Coulter. Excuse me, December 10th, John Coulter. We were listening. The December meeting, December 10th, John Coulter. Very good. And thank you all so very, very much. Delighted to have visited Great Falls. Okay, see you in the door.